Humanity, Culture, Voice. Hi, everyone. This is Heather Vickery. Thanks so much for tuning in to this week's episode of the Brave Files podcast, where every week we interview somebody who has stepped out of fear and into bravery in every possible way. Folks, we all face obstacles. Some of us face more obstacles than others, but nonetheless, the obstacles are there. And I often wonder, how do some people go from being under a pile of obstacles to actually standing on top of that pile? When I ask myself this question, I regularly come back to the very same answer. I think they get there by being kind, by being honest, by being authentic, and by being resilient. This week's guest is all of these things and so much more. She's a powerhouse of a human, and I'm really lucky to know her. Kiri Marie Moore changed her story and then continued on to change the story of leaders across the world. She's a consultant for global CEOs and focuses on helping them not only grow their businesses, but shape them into something that can help humanity as a whole. This week, we have a fairly different discussion than we normally do, but I think it's still such brave and incredible work. We're talking about how corporate leadership is changing and what each and every one of us can do to be part of a humanity-based solution to the corporate problem. I love this episode. I love this conversation. Kiri Marie just just lights me up in so many ways. But a few of my favorite takeaways include knowing you can always change your story. It's just a story. If you want to change it, you have the power to do so, to believe in yourself, have the mindset to do that. If you don't have the mindset to do that, you can create that. You can work on that. And slow change is always better than a quick fix. That's a really good one, folks. Think about that for a minute. Slow change is always better than a quick fix. We don't want to band-aid the problem. We want to solve it. And intention matters. Showing up to the table with the intention of helping humanity will always create the best results. And also recognizing your true values and protecting them. Before we get started, I want to let you know that for the very first time ever, I am actually having a Black Friday Cyber Monday sale. If you've ever wanted to work with me as a success coach, but have been holding back for any reason, time, money, not sure what direction you want to go in your life or maybe in your business, this is an amazing opportunity to give coaching a try. I am opening up four slots for VIP coaching days between now and the end of January at half price. I only take a few of these VIP days a year. I love them. They are so much fun. And we get to really dig in on one particular thing that you want to transform or create, design or develop in your life and or in your business. And you may be wondering why in the world would Heather offer these at half price? And the answer is quite simple. I want to. In the spirit of the season, I want to help you design and begin to create a life that you absolutely fucking love. The VIP day includes four to five dedicated hours, either in person or virtually. The choice is yours. You can come to me here just outside of Chicago, or we can do it online. And you will walk away with an actionable plan and clearly identified steps for finally getting started and getting out of your own way. Plus, you're going to get a follow-up session a month later for additional accountability. And we all know accountability is where it's at. If this interests you and you want to learn more, please check out vickeryandco.com slash Black Friday 21 for all the details. There are only four spots. Once they're full, they're full. And then we'll be back to regular pricing and regular scheduling. I can't wait to connect with you, and I hope that you are one of those lucky people that gets a very special VIP day. All right, now let's meet Carrie Marie. This is Heather Vickery, and you're listening to The Brave Files, stories from people living courageously. When we choose bravely in big and small ways, it powerfully elevates our lives. 
I hope these stories connect with you and encourage you to embrace bravery in every possible way, day after day. Together, we can build a movement of courageous living that enriches both our lives and our communities. And if you enjoy the show, I ask you to please share it with others. Maybe think of someone who you want to choose bravely right alongside you. Thanks for tuning in. Now here's the show. Listeners, sometimes we meet people and we just know that they're special. They bring some sort of unique light or energy into a space that it wasn't there before. And that's how I feel about today's guest. And I'm so excited to introduce you to my friend, Carrie Marie Moore. She is... Well, she's just a hell of a cool person, but she's also a pioneer with a cutting edge approach to leadership across the globe. And for her, it's all about heart-centered, human-centered work. She is super comfortable with the uncomfortable and a a really interesting future thinker. And we were chatting and I invited her in to specifically talk about how we redesign leadership from that human-humanity perspective. She's also got a bunch of kids and grandkids. And I think that that's cool because she is just such a neat person all over the world. Carrie Marie, welcome to The Brave Files. Oh, so excited to be here, my friend. Let's get get this happening. Let's get it happening. I know we've been trying to do this for like a year now, maybe longer. Well, you know, sometimes like a wine, it's got to mature, doesn't it? It's got to (laughs) like, it's the finest comes because you give it a little bit of time. So maybe that's what this was about. I think so. I like that. We, I think this is a very different conversation than we would have had a year ago. Uh, but before we dig into what we came here to talk about, I'd love for you to just tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. You're a bit of a globe trotter. Yeah. Yeah. Give people a little background on you and what you do, and then and we'll go from there. No worries. So I, you know, I love the world because it's such a great learning ground. And so, you know, one of the focuses that I really, I don't know, I guess I really live for is being able to help leaders across the globe to be able to put into place exactly what it is they really want to be doing, whether that's playing at a little level, whether that's playing at really big levels, and then find the solution. I always say it doesn't matter what result you want, there's always a solution to find that pathway there. And I get to do that a lot, and it's fun and exciting. Uh, but it's also really like individualized to the the leader that I get to work with. And I think that we all can make decisions going forward. What if we could actually make decisions that are going to add value to humanity going forward? And that's kind of my passion, my drive mm. to see that we are adding value to humanity going forward, not taking away from. I love that. Now, tell us. How did you get into this type of work? Yeah, so I guess I was one of those, you know, young girls that didn't have a voice. And, you know, I if if anyone knows me in my past life, it's a very different world to what I do now. I get to travel the world. I have an amazing lifestyle. We've just bought another property where I want to be running retreats from in, in, in beautiful oh, Queensland I want to go to there. in Australia. <laughs> um, so it is just stunning here right now. So, I, you know, yesterday when I came back from on the other side, uh, you know, I saw th- three kangaroos and a koala bear, you know. So it was like crazy stuff. So I... But, but life design is really important because, uh, you know, we only get to live this, this, in my world, we only get to live one life and I want to make sure that every day counts. And, and I think that that kind of got me going, I didn't have a voice as a young girl, but what if I could help others, not just to have a voice, but to change culture it's yeah. not just for this generation, but the generations to come so that we have a, we leave behind a different footprint. And I think that that's the exciting piece and the piece to why I get up every day and get on with what I need to do. 
Yeah, I, I love that. And it's so impactful when we hear folks who say, I didn't have this, but that doesn't mean you can't have this. How can I help other people not feel the way that I felt? Before we, di- we dig into talking about leadership and, and redesigning leadership with this human component, can you just quickly share with us how you go from being somebody who doesn't have a voice. Like it's it's yeah. a long, I know it's a long story and it's a huge, I mean, a vastly different transition. You're talking about this magical lifestyle that you work really hard for and have earned and deserve. And it's amazing. And I love watching you. You guys all want to follow her on the socials because <laughs> <laughs> Carrie Marie is all over the place doing really cool things. Uh, but this is a huge transition and departure from your life as a child, as a yeah, younger person. Absolutely. Yeah. So here's the thing that I really believe is that we have to have vision. We have to really see where we want to go. What does that need to look like? And so I guess I never was satisfied. And, you know, there were moments in life where I didn't want to keep living my next day, let alone the next hour. And you have to get a vision that is beyond where you are right now into a place where you maybe aren't at this moment but could get excited about and then you've got to have drivers that are stronger so I could have stayed in my old story I could have you know I've had years as a young girl growing up out of abuse you name it it was there and all the stories that you go I would hate that if one of those happened to me I could tell you zillions of stories but here's the, here's the thing, that was my old story and I had to get a new story. I had to disrupt that pattern. And so I became fascinated going, why is it that some people get to, you know, change their world? And it didn't mean that they were always served that, that that was their DNA. And I was I became fascinated going, how can I figure out, almost like hack your brain, to figure out how to rewire the brain to different behaviors and then get different results. And if I got different results, that would change my story. And then hopefully, you know, I always believe that if I could change my story, then probably that would change the story of the children that I have and then Mm. the collective in which I'm involved in. And then, of course, my work across the globe. Oh, that gives me chills. I love that. I mean, it's not new. We I hear people say that, but just something about the way you say it, and I've said it, and I feel it when mm. we can change our stories. I mean, it's just that, like, it's, this is one version of you. This is one version of your story that does not mean you have to stay in that space. You can yeah, transform. Yeah, but so many do. That's the crazy thing about it, yeah. right? Because... And here's the reason that so many do is because in that moment, that is all you can see. And you have to go from that. And that's okay because that's your starting point. What is also exciting about that is it doesn't need to be your finish point. It doesn't need to be tomorrow's story. And we can disrupt those patterns right from this moment and I think that is where all of a sudden where we often in those cases don't feel like there's any power all of a sudden we start having power and then are empowered to bring Mm. the difference that we need to bring because it does take work by the way it's not an easy (laughs) thing I haven't got here it's not a it's not a bed of red roses it's not walking (laughs) through those tulips uh you know it really isn't and I've had to I've had to do the hard work. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yes. So much hard work. But it is so lovely to say, I can change this. I can create this. And there's really that point of visualization. Is it doesn't have to be like this. And so that is something that you and I both do. We do it differently. We do it with different people. But in corporations, with folks, in leadership – to help them imagine a different scenario. Mm. This can be done differently. And that is when we were just doing a catch-up chat a few (laughs) months ago, like, let's have a podcast interview and talk about that. So thank you for sharing a little bit of your background, because I think it will really help the listener, you know, understand your perspective and, and how you have such authority on this, which you really do. Carrie Marie, business as usual is not business as usual anymore. <laughs> I've noticed that. <laughs> and 
So I'm curious from your perspective, because you work with so many top global leaders. Do they know that or do you teach them that? Like, do they come to you because they're like, oh, my God, what do I do now? Or do they come to you and then you go, check it out. We need to make some You know what? I think there's three levels that I get to work with. There's the emerging leadership. And those are the those are the ones that kind of are tiptoeing and are starting to think maybe the old approach to leadership isn't going to work going forward. Maybe some of those things that we know have worked in the past really are not serving us right now. And so they're sort of tiptoeing into uh, uh, the thinking and the work of maybe there's a need for a new approach. And then there's kind of like those that are influencers, those that are doing amazing things already, have amazing communities and mm-hmm. platforms and are kind of at that stage of, hey, we've built this out and it's doing awesome, but there's something missing. Or, you know, the story I hear a lot is, but I, you know, we're, we're building out the economic growth. One day we're going to make the impact. Can I just, you know, like absolutely stomp on that for a minute? Because I don't believe it's one or the other. Yet most people go, we're just building out our business. We're just building out our, you know, all the economic side of it, our resources, our tools, and then we're going to start impacting. And I go, that's actually not a truth because with every decision you make, at the table, it's having an impact. And that goes back to, but is it adding or taking away from? So there's those that are sort of getting to that stage going, actually, I just want to bring that sort of that future thing that they've always thought about doing as an impact or leaving behind what that is that they're doing. And that kind of moves into the third one, which is those that are already starting to leave behind an amazing footprint, but want to want to really build out their legacy. And, you know, mm. this is this is this is a leader that is probably doing or wanting to do a movement is innovating or wanting to innovate that next sort of really sustainable solution at the table. It's the pioneer thinking. It's my favorite place to play in. And it's favorite because it's not the quick fix. In many of the, you know, in this world, we're wanting the quick fix. We just want to fix a solution right now. And at that level, you know, yeah. it's about the sustainable solution. So yes. that's actually working on on footprints and pathways and plans that could be holding it a space for a 10-year-old dream, 20-year-old dream, 30-year-old mm. dream, right? And so yeah. that's fun, but lots of people find that difficult to to sort of hold that and work with that and keep moving towards that. And that's my favorite. I, that's a, that's my favorite too. Mm. And it's got to be sustainable, but there is a lot yeah. of taking apart, unraveling, unwiring to rewire that is required for this to really take root in the corporate culture. Yeah. So you're talking about these extremes and they're my favorites, right? So if you think of an extreme, it's like problem is one side of it and then this solution. So how do we narrow that gap from problem to solution? So and what you're saying is there's already things in corporate that are in place and systemic and mm-hmm. ways in which, and I, that's where I call that the old approach. Yeah. And I think that it is time to say if we were to look at a new approach, that means we have to change the conversation at the table. And that's part of the the work that I do a lot of because that's where leadership is at right now, where we are going, okay, so that was the old approach that's very systemic. It's, high, you know, the yeah. old patriarch. It's the, the biases uh-huh. kick in. You name it, the conditionings kick in on the moment. That is the old approach. Now, here's the thing. We, we don't – and the old approach is what the brain is wired to or the yes. systems are wired to or the yeah. processes. And what needs to happen then is go, okay, that's great. We're agreeing that maybe we need a new approach. Here's the thing. Most people know what the problem is 
most not people do not know <laughs> and do not know what that solution could be. And then yeah. you've got to not just know it on either side. So you now know the old, you now know the new. Here's the thing you have to do. You have to disrupt the old pattern and know how to then rewire to the new one and the new approach. And that, my friend, in corporate is very difficult because that means we're going to have to probably change the conversation at the table, change some of the systems, change some of the processes and, you know, maybe do it a different way. And we are so built in a society (laughs) (laughs) that maybe that is not a comfortable conversation. Yeah. Well, and it's fascinating because all of the things you're saying are the same things you said a few minutes ago about what you did for yourself. Mm -hmm. It's a conversation we have a lot in the entrepreneurial space, that whole, wait a minute, what are the solutions? How do we do this? We've got to completely try new things. And it's a little bit more industrious when we're talking about corporate. And there are so many people and there are so many egos and there are Mm. so many... Uh, it's got to be done this way because that's the way I like it or because that's the way it's always been done or that's what I was taught. Are you finding a lot of uh, resistance from <laughs> folks or is, is so, that getting better, I guess? I don't that know. is a great question. Now, here's the thing, and I think there's a third prong to this. So, you you know, you've kept you, you've captured exactly what I was saying there. And the third piece is this. And this is what my whole work is around. What if we came to the table and that's the decision table and actually instead of it's about this or that or whatever else or, you know, we've got to have this happening and it's about what is going to be best for the human race going forward Mm. and we actually think beyond our world and beyond what is happening right now and go, if we were to change it and this was to change culture and the way that we do it, is this going to serve us all going forward? And the reality Mm. is, no, it's not. And that goes back to my work, which is humanity as stakeholders. And I believe that if we use that as a lens, it would change culture totally. And so literally gives can, me I just, chills. can I just say to yeah. for the listeners so that they don't get lost. Oh my gosh, she's talking about humanity. That's way out there. She's talking about <laughs> stakeholders. What the heck is that? Like humanity you. is you You're the stakeholder. and I. <laughs> stakeholder yeah. is the value in which you measure. Right? So what yeah. if we we all came to the table and by the way we want to bring I don't even call it diversity to the table I call it distinctions Mm. and here's the reason why because if we come to the table and we come first as a human because by the way that's the one thing we've all got in common I hope are you a human I'm a human right so I (laughs) sometimes I wonder with some people but that's a different story right (laughs) um (laughs) But here's the thing, like reality is we're all human. That's our first point of call. That's our first commonality. And then we bring our distinctions. And I want people at the table to have different distinctions at the table because that's our learning. And we have to get to the table and be willing to have that conversation with different distinctions at the table and go, what if we use different lenses? Would that change the conversation? Would that change the outcome that we all agree on? And would that then change culture? Here's the thing. It does. I see it. I get it. You know, that's what I get to do. And it's fun and it's exciting. But is it easy? No, because firstly, you know, there's that common thing around how many touches is it? Seven, eight, nine hundred, four billion, zillion? (laughs) I don't know. Many. Well, here's the thing, because it's new, because it's not the usual, it's not what everyone else is doing, what I'm finding is leaders are needing those, that many touch points. So it's slow, it's Mm. about building relationships, it's about collaboration, and it's about being patient that this is a long, uh, you know, the sustainable side of it, it's not the quick fix. Not the quick fix. The quick fix almost never 
It almost never fixes anything. Well, it can band-aid I, things. It doesn't get it's to the bottom true. of it. Yeah, absolutely. I love the use of the word distinctions for many reasons. I'd love to to dig in on that for just a moment. Of course. I love it because it elevate I mean I I'm a big fan of diversity in general, of what diversity is supposed to be, but mm-hmm. it has turned into a dirty buzzword. My partner is a diversity inclusion expert, speaker, trainer, ah, uh, and her work is super important and, and she's incredibly good at it. But we already know, because research shows us that, you know, it's white cis men who are at the top of most of these you know, these chains, these patterns, and they don't like the word diversity. They bristle, right? They all of a sudden, their their mind gets shut off. They're, oh, I got to check all these boxes. But distinctions gets you kind of, it's like a sneaky back window. Yeah. Like- <laughs> but here's the thing that I think we need to do. So old approach was we use diversity at the table. What happened? People put their like biases on it, their conditionings on what that word means. We yep, have to yep. change the conversation. That means we have to put our own distinctions on those words, our own thinking, our own lenses. And instead of assuming, we teach. So I don't assume people know what humanity as stakeholders means. That's right. Right? So I have to go, this is what it means for me. How then do you translate that? And that's where we've got to get that feedback and go, what is it you're actually hearing? What is it you're taking from this? And that is one of my questions I ask all the time. Okay, so you've heard this. Now, what are you taking from this? Because we have assumed so much in life. And if we cannot, going forward in the new approach, assume we know everything. Because guess what? One of the things of traveling the world as a nomadic CEO was the more I traveled the world, the more I realized I knew nothing. And I mean that. And (laughs) that was kind of exciting for me because otherwise I get kind of bored because I think oh I've heard the same thing the same Mm -hmm. people are saying the same thing and you said an interesting thing you know you're saying that that the the top there's the white male and here's the thing that I'm seeing that is interesting so I am offering different opportunities for leaders to come to the table do you know what it's easy to say hey I don't have a seat at that table I'm not on those tables But when you give the opportunity for it, many are so frightened of taking that up, that opportunity. Absolutely. And I think that is the next story. See, we can get stuck in that old story. That's Mm -hmm. who's at the top. That's the tables. But there are tables if you are willing to step into. And then what does that look like when we have that conversation at the table? And this is a whole, you know, this is all the work in which the new approach comes into play. Well, there's a lot of there's a lot of research that shows that 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 part of the problem is that women and or minorities don't put themselves forward because we've already decided we don't have a chance. Now, obviously, not always, folks, but often in many cases, like there are so many statistics and stories about unqualified white men getting jobs simply because they applied for the jobs. Like you guys put yourself out there, but but Kira Marie, you said something, gosh, I just wish if we could bundle this up and, and give everybody a little dose of it. You said, here is how this feels from where I sit, from my perspective. You've heard me say this. What does that mean to you? How does that make you feel? What do you want to do with that information? If we ask, if we had that conversation with pretty much anybody about anything, we the world would be so different, wouldn't it? And how good would it be? And how exciting would that be? I mean, I just it would be like, wow, I get to learn something, I get to evolve, and I think that that is part of the new approach is that we have an evolving. See. Here's the old school. The old school teaches you, you need to have a business model. And when you're building out economic growth, 
My thing is that we actually have to now going forward in the new approach is build you know, smart, sustainable, scalable growth ecosystems. Here's yeah. the thing. We, we are not someone different when we go to work. We take that with no. us. No. Yes. We, we, when we go from work into our homes, whether we like it or not, we take that with us. So we are an ecosystem. Why are we building things out in our world? And here's the thing that is something with a world that is changing so fast and something that will hold you stead so good in the future is if you build out ecosystem going forward, not a business or not just a personal life or not just a profession. And those are really important things because we have to be able to move in and out of different pathways with effortless flow. Same vision, same drivers, same, but just moving always in a forward movement. And, you know, that's shifting from the problem to the solution at all times. We can only do that if we're building out these amazing ecosystems and that is is something that will hold you in place because guess what we have to know challenges come we have to know that sometimes there's things out of our control we have to know that we are in a civil society where there are systems that are so systemic and so stuck in old ways but we need to be able to move with effortless flow towards what we know what we are meant to do every day even though these still exist and I think that is something that is quite hard for a lot of leaders at this moment to grasp is yeah but I need to just keep thinking about me as an individual I've got to get what I need I've got to be more of an effective leader what if You started thinking and using the lens that maybe if I think outside of me as an individual, I start looking at what I'm doing within my collective, which is fine, and your community, your platform, awesome. And then you go, so if I continue doing this, what is that footprint I'm leaving behind on the global space? I think we would really change what is happening across the globe right now. I do too. I really do too. I love that. So much of this is just the the call and response piece, right? Like we have to drop the assumptions, ask hard questions, but get everybody at that table. And again, we're talking about corporate here, folks, because I'm so fascinated by how this is shifting. And we, one of the things we talked about before, Karen Marie, was that the U.S. political climate has has impacted this greatly. And I want to talk about that. But before I say that, y'all can use this in any situation that you're in. Is is giving everybody who's at that table, first of all, scooting together and making more room at the table for other people, invite folks in. And yes, maybe you should put yourself forward more aggressively and say, I'm going to sit at this table with you. But also get everybody's feedback in the moment. Don't make assumptions about what they heard or what they thought or how it landed. Ask, find out. It's so important. So I'll just go back to that question. In your opinion, how do you feel like the U.S. political climate has affected global leadership? Mm. So this is such a great question. And, And I think, you know, what is interesting is where for a long time, I think there was this space where I know in the US, because and, and I know because I have done so much in the US and, you know, it was like the center of the universe is what was the belief of many in the US. <laughs> and yes, you know, we're getting some, past that. <laughs> I know, but here's some kudos because, you know, there were there were many great things that came out of the US. I think what is and and it was well known throughout the world. What I think is interesting is that often we're not hearing about some of the other amazing things in other yeah. parts of the world. Yes. Now, here is what has happened that I think we are in a space now where we have heard that maybe it's not as perfect and not as <laughs> you, you know um <laughs> the center of the universe as what maybe was 
hopefully where everyone thought it might have been at one stage and would be going forward. And I think that that kind of means then we are across the globe on this uneven keel. And, you know, I think that that's what our story is and our starting point is from now. Yes, there was many things that came out of the US, but it was also, well, it's such a good place of everyone letting know everyone else of what is happening. And Mm. I think that that gives a lot of, uh, you know, when you know what is happening, whether it's good or bad, it it means that there's other people who can come on board with that. And, and I think that that's what the US did well. It was a center of letting the world know, hey, this is what we're doing, and then getting other people on board with it. Now, here's the thing. I think we're at a stage now, I'm not sure we want to get on board with some of the things that are happening there. Yes. Right? Yes, and and, I, and and so we are now having to go. What if we have different people at that table? What conversation now would that have to look? And so I think it's an interesting world. I get to speak with a lot of political uh, leaders, and you know, even in the forum that I've co- coming up, there is a panel, and it's the it's the political sort of leaders on there, and there's an activist as well. And uh, it's an interesting thing because I've got this theory that I think we, you know, there's a lot of unrest of where people think the political stage is and leaders within the political space. And because of that, you know, people aren't trusting. There's not a lot of transparency. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of distrust on policies and moving forward into the future and so we have got this real kind of awesome space where I think as civil society there's a lot of power of what we can do now and we can change conversation if enough of us connect together to bring that conversation as a force Mm. and I think that this is where we have got to narrow that gap of what we're not seeing in the political space and then making sure we're doing it in civil society. But here's, and this is that third piece again. So that's great. We see that it's not happening in the political space. So whose responsibility? Okay, we could take responsibility. We own that. We need to change that conversation, bring that to the table. What if the third piece is there are actually people in the political space that want that change just as much as you do. And I think that's the third piece where we yeah. join forces with those that are actually, and there are, I've, I've been having an amazing, in fact, one of the people on the forum is literally someone who is in the political space and she is, you know, really wanting just the same things we do. Yeah. And so what if we combine our forces together and, and start moving towards the same outcome. It doesn't have to, and here's the thing we've got to understand in this new approach. The new approach is not that we have to all agree at the table. We just might even disagree with 99% of it. We just need to agree <laughs> on the 1%. And that yeah. 1%. And take action on that 1%. We move on yeah. and forward with. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I I really do. And that, you know, it's important to see all of those bits and those things matter. Wearing your values on your sleeve, I think as a leader and as a a corporation, those things really matter now. Where it used to be, stay out of it, keep your head down, just do your thing. As a consumer, I'm not interested in those companies. I don't want to give them my money. Yeah, I want to know where they stand. But you have to know what what you're willing to stand for, which is that big vision. You've got to know what you will do. So you've got to know your non-negotiables and your negotiables. This is really important because those drivers, so, you know, if they are your true drivers, then you will do whatever it takes to make sure that that happens. But you'll also know what you are willing not to do or that Mm. is not your genius zone or your lane to be in. And and I think that's really important going forward as well because we don't have to do everything. We just need to do what we're called to do well. Yes. I mean, hear that, folks. Just hear it. 
Yes, here it's as important to know what isn't for you, what isn't yours to pick up, what isn't your burden to carry, what isn't your thing to pursue, what isn't your zone of of genius. Yeah. And I I would just tag on to that, and I believe, I mean, I, I won't speak for you, but I think this is something that you feel passionate about. Also, is know who around you it does have that zone of genius. And like It's so funny you bring that up because that was my next piece of it. I just wanted people to get that piece yeah. first. And totally. And here's yeah. the thing. You know, lots of people who know me know that I've spent some time with Richard Branson. And, you know, one of the, the he's such a mentor to me from afar. But one of the best things he ever said to me was when I asked him, I said, so Richard, you get so many business opportunities. You get so many, like, amazing, you know, movements to be a part of or whatever it is. How do you know what to do? And I just love his reply. It changed my life. He said, Kira Marie, I don't just, I don't go, what can I do? I go, who in my world do I know that could do that piece, that piece, that piece? And this yeah. comes back to that whole ecosystem, right? Where it's not just about me as an individual. It's me as a collective and part of the global space. Who do I know maybe over there that could do that piece? Who could bring that? And that means you're also bringing different distinctions to the table because guess what? The old approach was we all look the same, sound the same, and we do the same thing. The new approach is, wow, we might sound different. We might definitely look different and we might actually come up with different solutions at the table. Yes. Oh my gosh. I love it. And I love Richard Branson and I love that you're friends with him. Oh, he's just an I'm... awesome man. Like, honestly, he's <laughs> an everyday human. He's just yeah. doing extraordinary things. And the only reason he's doing it is because his vision was beyond himself and his drivers were way stronger than himself. I have never met someone who is such an extrovert. By the way, I'm an ex- I mean, sorry, an introvert. I'm an introvert too. Me but, too. But the thing is, our drivers are stronger than, than that power. Like, it's like, you know, that old story, we could stay in that old story, but our drivers are stronger than the old story to actually change that story and then bring about something that is beautiful and is going to have an impact going forward Mm. on humanity. I just love that. I love it. And that any it's there for anybody. It's there for all of you exactly. and who you spend and your time with matters. Thing. Yeah. Yeah, it so is. And that feels like a great opportunity. We could talk about this for a really long time. <laughs> um, I can't wait to be in an, a room again with you. We've yeah. had the, the pleasure and privilege of having a couple of meals together in the past. And uh, the conversation just is, is never, ever not amazing. It's always wonderful. But... You know, it's a podcast interview, and at some point we have to come to a close. But this feels like a good time to ask a question that I love because these are things worth celebrating and the work that you're out there doing. And the, and more than that, the life that you're out there living so thoughtfully and intentionally and, and creating for yourself and your family and your community, these are things worth celebrating. How do you, Carrie Marie, like to celebrate? Yeah. So I love to celebrate and I, by the way, I think it's something we don't do well in our society and we need to do it well. And I agree. so I'm kind of random as everyone knows, and I think really differently. So for me, celebrating is doing something I've never done before. So an example being yesterday, by the way, actually two day, two days before that, I decided I'm going to go for my boat and my PWC uh, licenses. And Congratulations. Thank you. So yesterday I spent all day, uh, most of the day doing the practical side. So now I'm official and I have a boat license and I can go out <laughs> on a jet ski. Why? Because, you know, this place here is located in a place where we can go to uh, coffee if you've got bo- our boat in five minutes. And, uh, you know, I wanted to be able to, to make it different and add some value to the retreats that I put on here. 
That to me is celebrating. It means that I can get excited because I've pushed, I think it's that adrenaline thing. I've always loved the physical. And so for me, it's that I get to celebrate. I get to uh, feel that adrenaline of doing something that I couldn't do yesterday, but today I can now do. Something that maybe I thought was impossible is now very possible. And I love, I know it's sort of a weird way to celebrate, but it's that to me, just it's almost like adding another skill set to your to your tool set, right? It and is. I find that I think exciting. those are yeah. Magical ways to celebrate. Mm. Can I ask a question? How do you celebrate? Of course. Yeah, uh, I agree with you. I'm a big fan of celebration. I forgot that I was muted. I was like, yeah, uh uh-huh, yeah, as you were talking. And then I looked (laughs) over and I was like, oh, you muted yourself, Heather. So, you know, we all do it. Um, I... I celebrate in a lot of ways. I am a big fan of small celebrations, like uh, quiet moments alone where I go, oh, fucking A, I did that thing. That was good. I'm a dance party girl. Those who listen a lot know I love a good dance party. Sometimes I celebrate by going, I'm going to shut this down and go for a walk. I'm going to take a break. Uh, I love to tell people. I love to tell people, like, I did this amazing thing. Will you will you jump up and down with me? Will you celebrate with me? And I don't – that's more of what I do than just about anything. And we do big ones. In fact, my partner's taking me out to dinner tonight to celebrate having a number one new release best-selling book that came out just Yay, the other week. That's awesome. It's just super exciting. That's so uh, cool. But it was – but the but my favorite celebration of the book is has been getting the feedback from people who are reading mm. it, right? And just sitting there and absorbing it and accepting it and saying – I did this thing and that was good enough for me, but also that people like it. And that's really fucking cool. (laughs) But that's why you get up every day. That's why you changed your story was so that you could see lives, you know, be a part of other people's lives. I remember for many years, I was a speaker for young people and I did that for a long time and, you know, worked a lot with street kids um you know gangs you name it are those the prostitutes like it was like full-on right Um, my world Mm -hmm. what Mm -hmm. I realized though was when they were in in my space in the programs that I was putting on lives changed no they didn't yeah it just band-aided the problem and so here was the thing what I love to see was when I didn't just band-aid I helped to actually rewire patterns and disrupt those patterns to actually change results at the table. And I think that's what you get to do when you celebrate hearing those stories that are coming back from your book is lives actually being changed. And we should all be celebrating that because that's going to change what is happening to humanity going forward. Yeah, I agree. And I and I love it. And I love you. <laughs> and I get to ask you what your favorite charitable organization is to support. Well, I, I'd be really bad if I didn't say Voice Advocacy Foundation because it's actually <laughs> my foundation. And I love it because um, one of the, the big projects that we're doing is actually, and it, and it goes back to having these conversations um, you know, I've spoken right from the kids and the and the teachers in the village and then right up to the sitting with the chief and finding out what he wanted in the village going forward. And so we are building a training organisation uh, right from the ground roots of bringing in a kindergarten in there um, up in the highlands of Fiji. And, you know, that excites me because it's a sustainable footprint that is not just what I think is good, but is actually what the village is needing going forward to make it a sustainable village. Because by the way, what happens is that um, they've now got high school or some parts of high school into the village up there. And, uh, but what happens is so many of the kids are going out of there and never coming back to the village. Well, it'll die off. So you've got yeah. to build it back into into the village and make that a, a beautiful core to 
to the next generation. So things like that I love. Um, and I just, you know, impact's a massive part of my world. Yeah. So, you know, I think it's partnering up with lots of people who are doing awesome things and going, how can we do this better? And what, what do you need? Mm. But I have to say for anyone that thinks about, and this is what we're trying to change with the old way versus the new way. And again, with an ecosystem, with a foundation, we don't just do like a humanity project, which is the, the project up in the, the highlands. We make sure there's always a sustainable project that works in conjunction with. So that if you never ever got outside help, you would always be able to sustain those projects going forward. I've been involved in so many projects over the years and foundations and, and charities where when the money stopped, the whole thing stopped. And imagine the lives that that had an impact on. That was pretty full on. So, you know, we've yeah, just got to, we've got to do things differently. And so, you know, it's all evolving. We have just re, we've had to change it a lot with the whole thing that's happened across the globe in the last couple of years and mm -hmm. and so we're coming out on the other side of that going this is how we will do that going forward as well yeah. so you I know life is full of changes oh that's the only thing you can count on i love yeah. that and i love you and i'm so grateful <laughs> thank you that you chose to spend um some time here with us today we had some technical difficulties you guys shouldn't know we that did. when you hear it because andrew's going to make it all sound amazing but Carrie Marie, thank you for joining us from across the world, literally. And uh, I want to come to one of your retreats. I'm, awesome. I just, I'm going to be in the same space with you as much as possible. Uh, I love you, girl. This has been awesome. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate you. Thank you for being here. Listeners, thank you so much. I can't wait to hear how this is impacting you. What story are you willing to let go of and rewrite? How are you going to redesign and think about your impact, right? All of that is so wonderful. This is Heather Vickery reminding you today and every day to go out and choose bravely. Bye. Hey, friends, I want to share something really exciting with you. We already know you enjoy listening to podcasts because you're listening to this one, but I'm also betting you enjoy audiobooks. And hey, listen, if you don't already enjoy audiobooks, then it's time to check them out. That's why I'm really excited to share Libro.fm with you. They are an incredible new platform for listening to audiobooks. And by choosing Libro.fm over other audiobook services, you are supporting a local bookstore of your choice and investing in your local community. Libro.fm offers over 150,000 audiobooks via their primary platform, which, by the way, they built with love and from scratch because they're a small business also. They even offer bookseller recommendations for great audiobook options. You can sign up right now via www.vickeryandco.com slash LibroFM. That's vickeryandco.com slash L-I-B-R-O-F-M. And when you do, you'll get one free audiobook of your choice and the proceeds will go to your favorite local bookstore. Now, check what I just said there. You're going to get a free book, and the proceeds are still going to go to your local bookstore because Libro.fm makes sure that their booksellers get paid even when they give a promo to customers. I've listened to over 20 audiobooks this year alone. I especially love listening to memoirs read by the author, and it feels great knowing that all of my purchases support my local bookstore, The Book Table, in Oak Park, Illinois. Libro.fm. The same audiobooks, the same price, but a completely different story. Check them out right now at vickeryandco.com slash Libro.fm. Have you ever thought about starting a podcast? Maybe you've had this thought and then quickly shut it down because who has the time? Or you don't know how, or gosh, it just all seems too hard. If you have something to share with the world, we want to encourage you to get your message out. The world needs to hear it. Did you know that 50% of all homes are podcast fans? 
If you've ever wondered about having your own podcast or how it can increase your business or get your message across, then please join me and the other experts from the Podcast Power Academy for our monthly free Q&A session. It's called, So You Want to Start a Podcast? This casual live conversation will help you understand how podcasting can be a great decision, why now is the best time to get started, and how to get into action with it. Visit podcastpoweracademy.com to learn more. You've been listening to The Brave Files, stories of people living courageously. To learn more about the show, find our show notes and full episode transcripts, or to get some great bonus content, visit thebravefilespodcast.com. And we would love to know what you think of the show. You can give us a call at 312-646-0205. Let us know your thoughts on the episode, the show in general, or maybe share with us how you're out choosing bravely. This episode is brought to you by Vickery and Co. Success Coaching. Coaching that helps you maintain a life well-lived and a business well-run. Learn more at vickeryandco.com. Our music was created and produced in a custom collaboration with Matt Lewis from ML Creative Consulting, a boutique firm dedicated to helping clients identify their unique sound and amplify their brand with custom delivered soundtracks. We couldn't do any of this without our extraordinary audio engineer, Andrew Olson. Learn more about him and check out his work at findandrewolson.com. And special thanks to everyone on Team Brave from our producers, associate producers, copy editors, writers, and support team. Special thanks to Molly, Mary, Kim, Sabra, and Sabrina. I'm your host and executive producer, Heather Vickery. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll talk to you next week.